I'm so excited to have you with us, mashallah. We've had just a an outpour of, of questions is really the best way to describe it. I think this topic of family dynamics is one that has a lot, um, a lot of emotion that comes with it and a lot of pain. And as I've heard you speak in the past about how to navigate um, family gatherings and particularly when there's, you know, members of the family that are well, difficult to deal with, inshallah, <laughs> um, but to keep that peace as well. Um, and today, inshallah, we're going to start with the, the first set of questions have to do with probably the first people, some uh, first members of our family that some people will meet, which are their own parents. So there's a first series of questions here, particularly about, um, and if we'll kind of categorize this in two sections, we'll say for those who are still um, you know, young and living kind of at home or have gone to college and come back for, you know, holiday uh, and they're with parents again. So they're, they're young adults, right? The versus the next set of questions is more related to those who are the, themselves, you know, um, ha- parents themselves, but they come back to see their parents. And so there's some friction there. So in the first set of questions, there's always a question about how do I deal with someone who's been harmful to me, that there's been a clash of personalities, or they're very controlling um, and difficult. Yeah. So, assalamu alaikum, everyone. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barik ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyyina Muhammad. Uh, thank you for inviting me here, and congratulations on Maristan. I think it's a wonderful um, endeavor. And we're hoping to bring you here to Minnesota to do the workshop for the imams, inshallah. I've been talking to imams and uh, they're really excited about it. Inshallah. Um, inshallah. Yeah, inshallah. So I, I, I want to, before I just dive into answering questions, I just want to have a little disclaimer here because, mashallah, I'm sitting with Dr. Rania, psychiatrist, a specialist in um, these uh, family dynamics, especially when related to like human emotion and things like that. And I'm, my perspective is different. I don't come here as a specialist in psychology. I don't come here as a specialist in psychiatry or therapy or communication or any of it. I come here rather as I would say um, a specialist in being human and fumbling around. Yes. And, um, I also come here with the great blessing of having been able to read deeply into the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and having that opportunity to reflect on that. And uh, one of the books that you mentioned is Project Lena. There's a whole chapter called Tend Your Ties. And in order to write that chapter, and Gia Maxfield and I, we spent a lot of time thinking and talking about this concept of how to manage and deal with family members, really family dynamics. How do we tend our ties? These are ties. We're not, our goal is not to untie them. Our goal is not to remove them. Um, So how do we do that? So that's my perspective that I'm coming to you from. Um, And I do hope that everyone who has serious issues sees your therapist and your psychiatrist and all and your doctor and all the people that you need to see. Okay, now uh, to address the, the question about the first question is children's relationship to parents and how those are some what happens when parents are controlling and difficult and abusive and things like this. So for this, I want to talk a little bit. I want to just paint the background of this and remind us of four of the companions. Allahumma salli wa sallam barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad, four of his companions. And this is, and we're giving an example of four, not to say that these are the only four. We have Salim Mawla Abu Hudayfa, Musa'ab ibn Umar, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, and Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah. All four of these have stories of difficulty with parents, missing parents, controlling parents, um, abusive parents, even. And uh, as a result, we gain perspective. So very quickly, Asala Mawla Abu Hudayfa was someone who actually didn't know his parents. He was raised by Abu Hudayfa and his wife, Subaita, and they were um, very loving to him. But he didn't know who his parents were. And that in and of itself 
has a um, an effect on the soul, an effect on 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 the person. Musab ibn Umair, we know that after he became Muslim, his mother was furious and locked him in the house and um, attempted to stop him from his belief by threatening him with uh, removing his privilege. He had been rich and privileged before. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, also his mother threatened to... Uh, uh, threatened all sorts of things. Also, she threatened to, uh, in, a, in this sort of controlling, manipulative way, telling him, oh, your prophet says you should obey your mother, so here I am, I'm your mother, listen to me. I say you should leave your religion. Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah, uh, his, we don't really know uh, much about his father, but we know that he was a uh, slave to someone who... Um, uh, burned him, literally burned him with hot iron. Now, of course, we've just quickly gone over these uh, stories and we ask ourselves, okay, well, what does that have to do with me, maybe? But it has a lot to do with what has become a, what I would say, a, a healthy, but we have to be aware of it, of, of how it might affect us, a healthy awareness of what we see around us that may be unhealthy. I don't know if that was very clear. We're developing as a community a healthier awareness of actions and sayings and things around us that are unhealthy. We're not the first people to have unhealthy relationships. We're not the first people to struggle with the parental and child relationships and all of the other relationships that we have. And so when we look to these companions, and when we look to our dean, we have to walk with certain principles. And that's why I guess I'm not jumping into the question, so forgive me for that. But the, 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 it's, the, there are certain principles that we hold on to that help us to move forward. And so uh, we, I mentioned these four companions that struggled with their parents in all different ways. And yet, we don't have any narration of them mistreating their parents though their parents mistreated them terribly. We also, interestingly enough, don't have narrations that I know of, at least, of them trying to control or change their parents. So interesting. We have instead holding on to being responsible for themselves, responsible for their behaviors, responsible for their words, responsible for their faith, and remaining confident in themselves. And so um, I think that if I, if I will take just this and circle back to that particular category of questions, the one that is children's relationship with parents and how do we deal with parents who are controlling even after you've grown up and have children. Um, you know, parents are just like you struggle to see your parents as human beings, your parents struggle to see you as separate human beings. And whenever you make mistakes, they feel guilty, like it's their fault, which it isn't actually. Your mistakes are actually your own fault. <laughs> they did their best. I really, something Maya Angelou said uh, in a poem, I won't be quoting it exactly, but it's something like, I did my best with what I knew, and when I knew better, I did better. I really believe that this is the case of parents always. That we, I'm a parent, we do our best with what we know. And when we know better, we do better. We try. And so as children, if we can recognize this, as adult children, if we can recognize this in our parents, or if we can have a husn zan in our parents. I mean, even the mother of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, yes, she was selfish. Yes, she wanted him to go to leave his religion and go back to what she wasn't embarrassed of. She was embarrassed that he was following the Prophet. Sallam. Yes, that is what she wanted, but she wanted it out of her belief system, what she thought was best. Parents don't look to children and think, ah, what is the worst and how can I find it for you? They just may be mistaken for whatever reason about what is best. In the case of these companions, their parents were mistaken mostly because they were outside of deen, they were bringing belief systems that weren't connected to faith, 
to Islam, to the Prophet And so I think really having husl zan in our parents is a very important thing. And especially as you, as you begin to grow into adulthood, remember that moment when you grew into adulthood, you had your first child and you said, whoa, it's a lot harder than I thought. That's going to remain for the rest of your life. That's not going to stop. It's not just because you have a baby now and you nurse that baby like, wow, my mother did this for me. No, it's going to keep on going until they're seven, until they're 12, until they're 20, until they're 30. I don't have any in their 40s yet, but I'm certain that it will continue. So have us the Zan. Think well of your parents. Um, included in this list of questions are things like, what about toxic and abusive parents? Remember these companions. It's not your job to fix your parents. Allah's not going to ask you, why didn't you raise your parents correctly? It's your job to control your own emotion. SubhanAllah, the, um, the prophets, I don't know if I should keep talking, Dr. Dani, if you want to ask questions. Um, no, please, it's Fadlani say I okay. will jump in just shortly here, inshallah. Please, please okay. continue this. So the Prophet Sallallahu also, like we gave some examples of companions, but when we talk about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his family, I find stories that are really, they're, they're mind-blowing actually. Um, they, and one of the examples I think of the most is he's, you know, he's received revelation. He struggled with this. He's, he's, he knows his work now. The da'wah has been private for so long. And now it's going to be public. And his first, he knows what to do first. He calls his family to talk to them. And his own uncle interrupts him, insults him, and makes sure that everybody leaves without listening. I mean, I imagine, I can imagine what all of us in audience today might say <laughs> in this occasion, or think, or maybe just feel. Why did he do that to me? And maybe obsess over why did he do that to me? And remember it until we turn 92. The Prophet ﷺ didn't do that. He said, oh, okay. I mean, I'm not quoting here. I'm just, instead, he had another dinner, invited the same people. He didn't even uninvite him. We would all be like, it's ha'i. I cannot invite him because, you know, he treats me badly. No, he invited him. But this time he spoke before he fed them. This time he knew to jump and speak before he gave him a chance. And still he insulted. And still he attempted to undermine the talk that the Prophet and continued, as we all know. We all know that throughout the seerah, he get, uh, there are relatives that hurt him. Hurt him. We don't hear that this stops him, that it causes trauma, that he obsesses, or even that he uh, doesn't forgive. MashaAllah, Abu Sufyan, Abu Sufyan, radiallahu anhu, who becomes a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu He literally, at that moment, when Abbas, radiallahu anhu, is pushing him to become a Muslim, he says, La ilaha illallah. Hmm, not sure. I mean, come on. Enough already. And the Prophet Sallallahu <laughs> is not only uh, generous and kind, but generous with uh, gifts. And things to alif bayna qulubuhum, yani this, this verse, this concept of giving in order to, to tighten hearts, to bring our hearts, not to tighten the heart, but to tighten our hearts uh, together. One last point um, I want to make, because I have an observation, and again, I'm not an expert. Of, so my observation, which is a note about narcissism, does not come from the place of psychology or psychotherapy. It comes from the place of sociology and leadership. From my own my own studies in leadership studies, that's what my doctorate's in, and the sociological theories and books and things I read about that. Okay, so this is not about a narcissistic personality disorder. This is about narcissism as a concept. I, uh, as I look around and I think about our history, hour by hour, I mean Muslim communities in general, I'm making a large generalization here. I I note that we have seen trauma for 400 years. By that, I mean colonialism. Colonialism, where literally we as believers were invaded by 
those who wished to uh, subjugate us, to take our resources, to humiliate us, to harm us, to, to take from our land and our people. And this, we have to recognize it's had an effect on us. Now, narcissism, the concept of narcissism, and Dr. Rania, please correct me if I'm mistaken, very simplistically, is someone with very low self-esteem internally, was struggling with self-esteem, that then uh, begins to make everything about them. I know that's very simplistic, but just uh, as, a, as a concept, so when we look at our societies, our societies have lost their self-esteem. We've lost as societies our confidence in who we are and who we are as we are connected to our faith. And as a result, we, are, we have developed narcissistic societies and narcissistic communities. And again, I'm not claiming narcissistic personality disorder, but qualities of narcissism. What are some qualities of narcissism? We have in our culture, manipulation, culture is up. Manipulation is accepted. Lying is accepted. And we're not, this is not me throwing out blame, by the way. These are things that happened because under colonialism and post-colonial dictatorships, people had to lie. They had to manipulate. They had to figure out how to do what they're going to do just to live, just to live. But I think it's important to understand it as we seek health in our families, that sometimes our parents, sometimes we come from that, from the places where manipulation is the norm, where, uh, uh, where uh, uh, secretiveness and sneakiness is the way you have to live to survive, and where lies are something it's not only okay to lie and to gaslight, I happen to love that word, by the way, but, and, and, but also to, um, to accept lies as though they were true. It's the strangest thing for me. Very, it's very outside my culture, but I've, I've learned to, instead of be frustrated by it, to look at it from the sociological perspective and say, okay, we need to bring Islam back to cure this cultural problem. Now, when we look into our families, we have to recognize that oftentimes some of the very problems in our families are things that are a result of years and years and years of this sort of cultural invasion of our family life. And so, I mean, I think that these are the, the really important things that we want to, that we want to really think about uh, when we, when we approach all of these questions. And to remember from these two things, one is that trauma and mental illness are for experts, okay? You, we, are responsible for our reactions and our actions, not theirs. And with this, we remember Sa'ad and Abi Waqas. I really feel this is very important because Yom Al-Qiyamah, Yom Al-Qiyamah, they're not asking us, how did Uncle Fred talk at the dinner table? So if you're spending weeks and weeks obsessing about him and not thinking about yourself, that's a, and how you're managing your behavior, that's a problem. Second, bravery and courage is a very important part of um, what it means to be a Muslim. And if you've read my article, I think especially what it means to be a Muslim woman. Um, but uh, And with family, to be brave and courageous, we often, we often feel coming in this, this sort of, this new culture of trying to be healthy and spiritually and mentally healthy, we often feel that we must be vulnerable and honest. I would say, and again, Dr. Rania, I certainly, um, whatever that word is, but I, uh, I recognize I'm not the expert here, but I would say that to be vulnerable and honest when you're safe makes sense. That's brave. It's brave and it's courageous. But if you're not safe, if your family is struggling, we don't look down on them or belittle them. We just recognize we're not safe. So instead, be polite and kind. We don't have to always be vulnerable and honest. We can be polite and kind. But there's no place in our religion for um, cruelty just because someone else has been cruel. Or... Um, uh, uh, I don't know. I can't think of the yeah. word that I want. Go ahead. Yeah. Mashallah. No, no, that's, that's, it's so, so important. So many things that you mentioned, Nancy, from that very beautiful kind of tying it in from the Sita, thinking about the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his Sahabas, his blessed companions. 
and how, and I would often think about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us these specific people, these specific companions, where with their specific stories, as diverse as they were, that then kind of echoes and parallels so many of our lives today. So many, you know, nuances between people's talk about family dynamics and interpersonal connections with each other. And, and it's beautiful how you can go back into the Sita and actually pull out and say, here's somebody that I can very much identify with their struggle, different, but very similar to mine, right? SubhanAllah. And I think there's a lot of healing in that. In fact, as I was mentioning with Madison, one of the main goals that we actually have in the space of mental health is to, when we say the Islamic lens and looking at things from the Islamic lens, it's not just a matter of like, let's see directly the Quran or the Hadith. Let's also expand that to all of the people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in that early society around the Prophet them that he directly was able to um, respond to and answer to and advise. And then they created generations and kind of ripple effects after. And a couple of things I'd say to the things you said here, um, when we kind of just, uh, uh, again, paralleling what you said kind of from a mental health perspective, it fits and is so in line like if we were to understand that this otherwise secular space of mental health actually had a lot of um, advice that we could find in agree and is in agreement with our Islamic values, there's plenty in the field that's not in alignment, which is why we're at medicine always trying to align, you know, what is, you know, take what's good and, and give away and throw away what's not good. But one of the things that's definitely, Kane, you touched on it and say one of the things that we say all the time in the space of mental health and in therapy is the rule of thumb, the very first rule of thumb in therapy is that you cannot change someone else. You can only change yourself. You can inspire change in someone else based on how you do and what you do and how you carry yourself. And if you yourself, like you mentioned, as if somebody is in a situation of abuse, of trauma, of difficulty to where you actually do, and it's like important and it becomes almost like, a, a, I want to say the word farat. <laughs> I know some people might be upset with me if I say that, but what I mean by it is not that you're going to find it in the fifth book. Instead, what you're going to find is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us that we actually seek out help when we need it. In the Quran, it directly talks about, you know, ask the people of knowledge if they don't know if you don't know. And the people of knowledge in this particular expertise, let's say a trauma, right? There are trauma experts. So people tend to try to mend their wounds or figure out how to heal in ways that maybe he's not with, you know, by their talking to their best friend, but your best friend is like yourself. <laughs> They're not trained either. And so people unfortunately kind of go in circles. And so we have a number of questions on say here now, you know, this is my encouragement, I hope, um, to, to, for people to seek out the experts, right? Seek out those people. And in fact, if I just take one moment before we go into the next question, set of questions on, say, of, um, if we could just share the slide, I'd like to put up the slide at the very top, you'll see this red banner because people always ask, okay, where do I go and get help? <laughs> and so we made a, a, a link on our website, on our website, that's uh, marisan.org is the website, but backslash resources, if you see that link, um, we just put all the directories that we could find that have Muslim mental health clinicians and experts. I don't know them all. I can't vouch for them all, but I'm putting them there for your convenience so that you can search by the state in which you live or the place in which you live. In some cases, they're international directories, maybe the countries in which you live. I hope we keep on expanding these lists, but it's here for you to be able to um, tap into help around you. The field is growing. There are many, many more Muslims who are entering into this field. And if they're not a Muslim, but they are an expert in their craft, right, they can also help you. So this is just a, a plug for people seeking out help, especially if you're listening to this and going, yeah, I think I need some more help than what I have, right? Please check out the resource list, inshallah. Now, as we carry on to the next um, question, inshallah, there is another set of questions, and this is probably a very hot topic in addition to parents, a uh, parent-child relationship is about in-laws, I'm saying, right? There are so many questions we've received about in-law dynamics. And um, for many people, their angst and kind of difficulty that they have is actually with their extended members of not their own family, but their spouse's family. And so, um, you know, we could probably address this from so many different ways, but before we do, I wanted to see, Anse, if you had for us kind of any specific advice um, in thinking about these members who we sometimes see, because there's questions about if they continuously hurt us, if they say things in front of us or behind our backs, if it's implicit or explicit kind of uh, ways of letting us know that we are not, um, not 
is so much welcomed, but just they're not so, you know, but they have a lot of criticism about us, whether the way we raise our kids or the way we're dressed or all of these different questions that people sent in. But the general uh, theme was around in-laws and setting boundaries and how to still be respectful, but kind of also respect your own space and boundaries as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the list that um, that you sent us. And I mean, I really think a lot of it is kind of the same answer. You know, when if I have aunts and aunts or cousins who are saying or doing hurtful things to me, then I'm going to be kind and polite <laughs> and not put myself in that situation and not get bitter. I really think that it's important to, you know what, I'm going to start this with a different beginning. These family members are family. And you're not getting rid of your family. Allah gave you these people. Either there's something for you to learn from them, and you'd be open to that. Sometimes exactly what you're dealing with is exactly what you need to learn. Maybe your maybe your personality is just so different than theirs. Instead of being irritated, learn. What a blessing, what a blessing to be around people that are so different than you that you can learn how to see the world differently like they see it. So learn from all of these different people around you. That's number one. Number two, when um, I really like to remind everyone that there's also the spiritual family. And sometimes we have a romantic vision of what our family should be like. And so it's not actually, actually what's, what we're struggling with the most is that our family doesn't live up to our so-called standards or what we think it should be. It should be like this. Actually, it should be messy. That's how it's supposed to be. So have a spiritual family. And Dr. Anya talked about seeking help. I also want to say have a spiritual family. Have spiritual people that, you, not to sit and share bitterness over, not to have coffee and tea with all the problems, no, but to grow spiritually with your friends who are talking about positive things, not always complaining, not always whining, talking about positive things, talking about, oh, you know, I only woke up for Tahajud for 10 minutes today. How are you waking up for longer? And having these kinds of uh, shared experiences of growth. I really want to encourage you to develop those kinds of friends and uh, that kind of community. Back to, like, there's lots of questions here. How to set respect, how to set respect, but firm boundaries with in-laws. You know, I read somewhere, and I think about this word boundaries a lot because it's not a, much of a word in cultures outside of sort of Western culture. Boundaries are, are a strange sort of concept. And I, but I read somewhere that boundaries are not for other people. Boundaries are for you. And that changes everything. Because again, we don't want to control everybody. This is not on the day of judgment. I'm not standing with everybody else. I love that word you used, inspire. Because as you, I mean, those of you who know me, my entire life is about trying to inspire people for positive cultural change in themselves, in their lives, in their communities. So yes, yes, with through education, through worship, through all of these things, yes. Yes, I do want to do that. But that's different than saying, hello, human being. Now I'm going to set boundaries. That means you have to behave in a certain way. What? Don't do that to me. <laughs> I'll be like, whoa, hang on a second. But you can set a boundary with yourself. What that means is get rid of romantic visions. Stop looking at television and YouTube and magazines and Instagram and wherever else you're that you are that you're looking at things and developing an incorrect picture in your head about how things are supposed to be there, there is no supposed to be this is humanity humanity is messy and the way it's supposed to be is we're supposed to struggle through this life move through this life in order to become better so that we can keep on honing and toning our nefs grow into better and better people stronger spiritually so we can help to be the so we can become of the khulafa of this earth and so that we can when we die when we die which this is a little secret i don't know if you know we're all doing that we're all dying everyone so when we do 
we can stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with as many good deeds as we were able to. Don't we, as you were able to, don't waste our time trying to change everybody else. So I see like some in-laws, I, my, I have always tried and certainly failed many times, but done my best to be the in-law that I want my in-law kids to be to me. And I think that's a really good rule. I mean, it's not about how they're acting. It's about how you're acting. It's really about how we are acting. That they're manipulative, but they're cruel, but they mean. They say mean things. Okay, become a duck. My auntie Sosan used to say that. Become a duck. When you get in the water, you don't get wet. And uh, what does it mean? It means it mean it doesn't mean you don't get in the pond or don't go in the water. You don't go to family events. You don't go. You're just like we have to stop being so little self esteem that all this stuff affects us. Don't you know yourself? If they tell you you're ugly. Why do you believe them? It's, that's it's a if someone says mean things, it reflects who they are, not who you are. And uh, and if Subhanallah, some of the older ulama they used to say that every Muslim needs four things: um, uh, someone who is a, a teacher, like someone above you to teach you, a student, some any someone who you, is under you to help that you help them grow. A friend, so like you're walking together, and the fourth one is an enemy. <laughs> I remember the first time I read that, I was like, huh? <laughs> Wait, what? I don't need an enemy. And the explanation is because enemies, they have the ability and they do things that are often not true, usually. They do things on purpose to hurt you. And so you quickly learn how to protect yourself how to grow up quickly, and how to be a person of strong faith where enemies don't influence you, only Allah does. And SubhanAllah. So family is not enemy, no matter what. I don't, they're just not enemy. They're not, they didn't wake up in the morning and try to figure out how to ruin your day, even if they're ruining it. They just have their own issues. And I really think in-laws are your new family. In, in Islam, families get married. Families get married, not individuals. Families get married. And so these are your these are your new family members. And you want to do your best. And I think your good rule of thumb is to be the in-law that you want your in-law kids to be to you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, will reward you with that and uh, give you that kind of uh, that kind of beautiful relationship. Yeah, I mean, one time on say in, in therapy, I had a <laughs> a person I was working with and she said, to me, you know, I just, um, uh, my family, she, she, uh, uh, her whole, all of her sessions pretty much were focused on her in-laws. I mean, everything was surrounding these people and she gave them so much space in her mind. Right. And for, and for sure, there were, I mean, real egregious things. These are not made up or make belief things, but she gave it so much emphasis in herself. And then subhanAllah, time would have it that actually, uh, she learned, uh, that now she was going to have a daughter-in-law. And the very first thing out of her mouth was, I can't wait. And I said, Khair, inshallah. You know, and she said, I'm going to do everything that was done to me to her. And I said, oh, no, 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 hold on, hold on, ya Allah. <laughs> and she had carried all of this resentment and pain and hurt. And literally, she was waiting to put it onto the next person. Right. So you can imagine now the rest of our sessions <laughs> had to do with, you know, really talking about the level of pain and healing that needed to happen for her to understand the opposite actually it's the opposite as you mentioned and say that, that you know this idea of you know what we call here that the golden rule kind of like do unto others as they <laughs> like do unto yourself this is our islamic rule right it's it's from the very beginning we have it within our faith and um but really what it really came down to is kind of going down to the very core and there was a lot of what you discussed is it really true what they're saying or doing all these mean and terrible things or is it more a reflection of their own deficiencies so probably on therapy just for everybody here because i'm everything you say on same kind of just giving a layer of um kind of that therapy mental health piece to it inshallah and part of um what we do in therapy just to demystify it for those who've never been and are wondering what is this thing that we do this talk is talking really help and heal it's very strategic talk a very strategic Talk. <laughs> it's very it's learning tools and, and, and how to actually techniques of how you deal with the people in front of you 
and around you. And one of the things we work on is, you know, really trying to empathetically, empathy is putting yourself in the shoes of that other person and trying to understand where did they come from? Why did those comments happen? What level of deficiency within them causes them to be able to say such terrible and egregious things, you know, or is it jealousy or is it feeling like you've taken this member of their family away from them? And maybe there's some rights due to give them uh, the space of this son <laughs> that you married, right. As your husband, you know, you know, back into the family, there's, and for every person, it's a different story. There's different reasons as to why this happens, but just to demystify a little bit, the kind of work we do. And certainly when you're working with someone from an Islamic frame, the advice and work and techniques that you learn may be the same, but the way it's oriented may be different depending on who you're working with in therapy. So, you know, we often say, hopefully somebody who is attuned to the Islamic values and morals, if not themselves fully practicing them, which would be better and better and better um, in order to, to make a person be able to heal. And so did you have anything more to say with the in-law uh, piece or would you like us to tackle the next <laughs> let's go here. to the next one the next i mean you know i think it makes me really sad that i mean that's just what i mean by this these cultures of passed on trauma and passed on manipulation right that it, it just it just continues and instead of taking a minute and saying wait where is my dean where where is my where is my being a better person it's just this and it, it becomes a sort of accepted thing in a culture and um yeah it's really troublesome very troublesome Alhamdulillah. I, I would say too, subhanAllah, I've also, alhamdulillah, and as in your work on the spiritual side, and say in my work on this kind of, um, I guess we'd call it psycho-spiritual side, is um, it's it's also beautiful and amazing. I just want to give everyone here the level of hope to know that when you do work on yourself, it is amazing, subhanAllah, this we believe in this Islamically, that intention, when you rectify that intention, subhanAllah, and you start doing better, and, and being the duck, and protecting kind of your stuff, you know, kind of me, putting your firm uh, personal boundaries as we learn, not on them, but onto yourself, right? Um, and you start kind of getting better, subhanAllah. It's amazing how many stories, like session after session, person after person I've worked with in therapy that they've said, you know, literally things have changed, not overnight, and usually not, you know, like this like revolution that happens. No, it's usually very consistent, but steady. And, but when you look back retrospectively, you know, months later or years later, you find subhanAllah, there was a real change that occurred. So I just want to, you know, give people hope that, that don't, don't, don't throw the whole, <laughs> don't throw the towel in and say, this is useless to get better with my in-laws. No, inshallah, there's definitely hope, even if you <laughs> think at this moment there may not be. May Allah bless us all, alhamdulillah. Mm. And say so there is a set of questions, of course, related to marriage. And um, separate from illness, but related more to things about uh, a lot of it is actually questions about relating to uh, differences in in uh, the way of looking at the world or the way of parenting, <laughs> or um, or in some cases actually co-parenting, blended families, and these are a little bit different. Each question is a little bit of a nuanced difference. I don't know which you might want to take on, Michelle. Well, I think. Um, you know, I used to, I really think that, again, when we're entering into any relationship, we have to get rid of this romantic Hollywood idea about what it's going to be. And we have to come in ready to talk and be human and have conversations. And I, I counseled a couple the other day, and I really was saying, you just need to trust each other. They have different parenting styles. That's okay. Like, it's okay. The it's okay for each person to be who they are because in the end the children will the children are are part of both of these people. There's no and when either one, the father or the mother, becomes super controlling or tries to control the other and say, You can't parent like that, it's really it's really it's not healthy for anybody. And subhanAllah, like we just don't see this. I mean I, when I think about the way of the Prophet ﷺ with his daughters, I think a lot about the Prophet ﷺ and Fatima radiallahu anha. I, I think about them in general, but recently I've been thinking about them a lot because Fatima radiallahu anha, Zahra, she experienced 
a whole life with her Prophet with her father, Allahumma sallallahu alayhi as Rasulullah sallallahu Now, that's significant for a number of reasons, but the reason I've been thinking about lately is that a lot of children complain and struggle with parents who are busy, parents who are um, who have a mission, parents who have like stuff going on. We've got weird myths in our community about what parents should be like, as though parents parents somehow when you have a child you lose all other inclinations to humanity, all other inclinations to your adulthood, and you're only a parent now. And first of all, that's not help in my opinion. Well, it's not healthy because you have to at least at the very least work on your relationship to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. At the very least. Um, but the when I think about Fatima radiallahu anha and how she grew for all of those years with all of the trials, all of those struggles, and she always still chose, she still chose Deen. She chose his message. And she was a follower of Rasulullah and a beloved of her father. It's not, they're not exactly the same, but they come together. And um, anyway, so I'm just very impressed by her, but I'm also thoughtful about the these strange ideas that we swallow hook, line, and sinker because someone said them somewhere about one thing or another. I, I think the metaphor of the palm tree is a good one. I use this metaphor in my book re relating to converts, but in actuality, I think it's good for everyone. And the metaphor of a, con of a palm tree of a convert, the metaphor of a palm tree I'm going to just read from page 21 the, the, the definition of a palm tree. Palm trees have a fibrous root system that shoot out hundreds of roots into the surrounding soil. So it's not like a tap, okay? It shoots out hundreds of roots into the surrounding soil. The roots are not long, deep tap roots of other trees, but thin roots that grow horizontally from the base. They stabilize and anchor the tree, allowing it to find nutrients and moisture. And the taller the tree gets, the wider the root base. So I know this doesn't exactly answer the question, but as parents, we have to be a palm tree first. We have to take care of ourselves first before we can be parents. We have to have roots that are, are strong and wide, lots of roots. That comes from our spiritual life, our ilm, what we're learning about deen. Our, our worship, our intentional worship, our sadaqa, our, our work on ourselves as human beings. And then we can grow tall. And the taller we get, though, the more we have to have roots. We can't, if we're going to grow taller without roots, we, we risk falling over. And a palm tree, you know, gives dates and gives coconuts and all these other wonderful nutritious fruit. So that's how we can be the healthiest parent. Not by following a book here or some weird... Uh, crunchy thing here or there like I just it bugs me when we define parent, good parenthood is with organic tomatoes and it also bugs me when we define good parenthood in any other way like it's not you know it's good parenthood is being a good the best person you can be and doing your best and you're gonna mess up and one day your kids are gonna go to therapy and complain about you but do your best and stand before so that you can stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say I did the best with what I knew and when I knew better I did better that's all I got. Oops, I'll answer, can I, ask you, I'll say, I love that, mashallah. And I hope everybody can, can imagine in their minds what that means about the palm tree. And if you don't have the book called Project Mina, this is a plug for you to go ahead. Oh, there it is, there it is. I think it's there trying is. to come through. There we go, <laughs> mashallah. To please, to please um, go ahead and, and get this book, please, because it's wonderful in its content. And so I was reading directly from and someone earlier asked, is there a book and say that you have your, uh, some of these ideas in, and this would be one of them. But I, as I understand it also, and what I understood, Anse, is that it's also a workbook, something people can work through as well. Yeah, I mean, there are, it's, there's a lot more to read than there is to do, uh, admittedly, but there are exercises and activities after every section. There are three sections, and then three sections in the, there are three modules and three sections in each module. The one I've been referring to tonight is the last one. It's called Tend Your Ties. And the first one is about knowing yourself, which is just good for any Muslim. But the book, and the second one is Declare Independence. But just FYI, the book is written to the convert audience. That's who it was originally written to.
yes, I think that's important to um, to keep in mind, inshallah, but really wonderful for all of our Converse sisters. And honestly, I think the many, I've learned so much from Project Lena and so I hope others can as well, keeping a course in mind the audience it was written for, um, yeah. inshallah. You won't um, have to, it's very clear. You won't have to keep it in mind. It's clear all over the book. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Alhamdulillah. As always in conversations like this, there is so much more to answer than we're um, able to uh, get to, subhanAllah. So many more questions that we're able to answer. And I do um, I do know, mashallah, and I want to be respectful of Ansi's time. We're able to take a few more minutes of your time, Ansi, or how are you? <laughs> I'm actually just checking my WhatsApp yes. to see what they're of course, of course. What they're saying about my then what I have next. I'm, okay. I, I have like maybe maybe about five minutes. Okay. Five minutes inshallah. Then we'll do kind of, if, if it's okay with you, Ansi, and for everybody who's attending, if they have the ability to, oops, maybe that's, <laughs> maybe that's your call right there. Mashallah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to let everybody who's attending know that inshallah, um, when Ansi uh, leaves inshallah, I will be able to stay behind because I see that there's a, a couple of questions specifically that are mental health related that I would like to get to. So you're welcome to Stay on, inshallah, for a little bit longer, and I'm happy to uh, discuss those particular questions, inshallah. Um, uh, but while Ans is still here with us, let's make sure we use uh, all of the time, mashallah, and barakah that we have uh, with her with us, inshallah. And Ans, in in one of the um, one of the points that sort of came up, and it had to do with, of course, all of the different um, various struggles. But I'm wondering about the concept of, uh, you know, any families that have children with different abilities. So, you know, mashallah, children with, uh, uh, we might say disability or folks today like to say differently able children. And if there's any advice you can have for them at this moment, inshallah, yeah. and how to navigate family dynamics uh, when people don't understand their children. So I just want to quote my dear friend, Ansar Edana, because I, mashallah, just, I, so Ansar Edana, who also teaches at Ribat with me, um, and is often a guest in our PM. She has a child who has Angelman syndrome. Now, much of your audience probably doesn't know what that is. And I um, don't, I mean, I, I'm not, but what it is, it's a syndrome that makes it so that her daughter looks, um, doesn't, she, you don't look at her and know that, that she's differently, that she's cognitively differently abled. You, but she, and she's she, she's healthy and strong and actually beautiful. That's Angelman. That's kind of the idea. Very beautiful, mashallah. But um, her mental capacity is about one and a half. So I was at her house one day. And I was admiring her, as I always do, and especially in her, in her ability to manage caring for a daughter who one of the symptoms of this syndrome is that you don't they don't sleep more than three to four hours a day so for 27 years she hasn't slept more than three or four hours a day because of caring for her daughter another symptom is that i mean she doesn't can't use the bathroom on her own nor can she speak so there's a lot there okay so i was just gushing with admiration and she said are you kidding allah allah has gifted me with Give the opportunity to raise a child of Jannah. And I was, and she started to cry. Not, yeah, I mean, not, she started to cry. I mean, I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky that I get to raise a child of Jannah. Then she made a joke. I think one of her kids is here, so forgive me for this. But she said, um, at least I know one of them's going. <laughs> Inshallah, all of her children are wonderful. Inshallah, they will all be together in Jannah. And it was funny, but I mean, when we have children with different abilities, they are just children. And the other thing she said, which is so important, is that Allah creates the ahsani taqweem in the best of forms. All children, all adults have been created in the best of forms. The best. There is no mistake here. This is, there is, there is learning here. There is blessing here. There is a different lifestyle than your neighbor. But mashallah, she, I mean, it, but I don't want to list all of her accomplishments because I don't want this to be like, even though you have, you get to do all these other things. No, this is the, the blessing that Allah gave you. Is it easy? No, but let me, but it's, it, it's, 
maybe it's it's a blessing that comes with things that are in the inside that you could never imagine. So I think really regarding all of our topics tonight, probably the most important thing is to check our attitude, check our taqwa, check our tawheed, check our tawheed, and um, sort of learn how to to respond to all of the the messiness with joy, with maybe the internal sitcom a little bit, finding things funny just a little bit and keeping it light. Um, keeping it light and keeping it... Uh, as as with the least amount of drama as possible i'm i'm kind of anti drama i prefer a little li, as little drama as possible that's my 5 minutes i will say if anyone wants to follow me i'm on facebook twitter and instagram at tamara al gray you'll see me in all three of these places you can take classes with me as dr rania mentioned in the beginning at ribat.rabata.org and you can find both of my books in the book i co-translated at daybreak.rabata.org and um, I look forward to uh, working with Maristan more in the future, inshallah. Oh, okay. And just um, working together, standing together, arm in arm with all of you ladies who are here tonight. Um, all of the helpers that helped you, Dr. Rania, and um, all of the audience members and everyone behind the scenes. And those who aren't here, standing together, linked arms, inshallah, really creating a new world for ourselves and for the next generation, a world that the Prophet ﷺ would, would not only be happy to come, would, would re not only recognize us as believers, but would feel um, like he finally met the ones he once cried out of longing to meet. Oh, Allahumma ameen, ya Rabbi ameen. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, Barak Fiki Anse. MashaAllah, it's always so wonderful to have you, Anse, Dr. Tamara Gray, MashaAllah. And it's sisters, we're going to, and perhaps brothers, <laughs> we're going to put the links that Anse Tamara mentioned. The book link is there already, but we'll also add some of the other links to the chat box so you can have access to them. And um, to be respectful of your time, Anse, we'll say salam to you, inshallah. And I'll stick around to answer a couple more questions. Barak Allah, Fiki Anse. Take good care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, my dear sisters and brothers, MashaAllah, I hope inshallah this has been a wonderful um, kind of a conversation for you. Uh, it's very much one that came from the discussion of a spiritual angle to the discussion on family dynamics. Now, I want to tell you something about Maristan and our goal with these learning circles and our healing circles, that these are programs, inshallah ta'ala, that we're hoping to have continuously, monthly, we hope, inshallah, and we hope to uh, approach each of the discussions from different angles. And so Tamara was very clear when she uh, joined us today that she comes from that spiritual uh, angle of, of us, uh, you know, someone who's really steeped in the study of Sira. That is one of her specialty topics. Sira is the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she gave many examples from that perspective. She was also very clear to explain that she's not a mental health professional and deferred some of the mental health related questions to, well, those who are in the field directly like myself and others. Inshallah, before we end today, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, kind of uh, address a couple of the main questions that came in that do have a very mental health component to them so that we're sure that together we have answered some of your questions. However, I would also say that this is the start of many more learning circles. And I'm already seeing, and I would love your feedback on this, but I'm already seeing almost like themes. I wonder if we can take even the topic of family dynamics and continue to break them down into further themes. Maybe there would be one just on the topic of in-laws and more nuance on it. Maybe there would be one just on co-parenting and the nuance of that. Maybe there would be one related to, um, you know, when there is discord between family members and the different levels of dean practice, because certainly that's something that comes up quite often and impacts you very clearly. Maybe one related to temperaments of different children and who they are and how sometimes that's challenging in the parenting mode. Now, before I forget, I want to tell you something very important and very exciting. One of the other organizations that I'm closely connected to, in fact, it's <laughs> director as well, is the Rahma Foundation, a sister organization to Rabata. And right now, the reason I mention that is right now, we have started a six-week uh, series, a six-part series on the topic of raising a spiritual child by another one of our dear teachers, Anse Sosan Imadi. And that's a term and so are very clearly, <laughs> are very, very much connected, mashallah. But they're also, their approaches and their teaching styles are different as well. And I hope, inshallah, you can benefit from both teachers. And um, maybe we'll very soon here put the link to that series. They happen on Friday nights. It's it's part of the Friday night halakha that I give every week. And so Sosan, who's teaching the course, is taking over 
is uh, taking over the halakha for uh, these six weeks, inshallah, and focusing. And last week we had the first intro uh, session and it was phenomenal. That's a lot of Allah. In fact, many of the questions some of you have asked were actually addressed in that session. And I can actually imagine that the next five sessions will probably answer many more of your questions, particularly those related to parenting, um, but also just related to being kind of um, in family dynamics, inshallah. So please use these resources to your benefit. Um, I'm going to ask, inshallah, that our slides, if we could just share them really quickly, because as I get ready to answer a couple more of your questions, I just want you to, to have some more resources in place. So if we don't mind on the Maristan side, please sharing our slides. And I also have to say, by the way, with these learning circles and healing sessions, that they are free, of course, for all of you. We actually want to spread knowledge as much as possible to all of you. But we would also really appreciate your support in allowing us to keep these going and to invite experts to the stage and to respect their time and honor their time, inshallah, if you can please donate to these projects, um, these healing and learning uh, circles, so that you're able, we are able at Maristan to continue them, inshallah, to add us. So we'll put that link for you to, to do that as well, inshallah. Now, in terms of some of the questions that have come up, um, well, other than logistical questions like recordings, as you can see, we are in fact recording these. And um, typically we do not record our healing sessions because those are where you unmute and talk and there's a lot of, you know, sharing the very personal things. And so we do not record those, but we are recording the learning sessions like this one so that you're able to um, benefit inshallah afterwards and others who couldn't make it here today can benefit as well. There are some questions related specifically to the topic of, uh, you know, when you have difficult uh, members of the family or difficult dynamics between um, people who are meant to be close to you, whether these are, you know, whether these are parents and whether these are in-laws, um, or even adult children, or you maybe are the adult child in the situation, I think it's important to, um, uh, to really say a couple of important things from the mental health perspective. On the spiritual side, the concept of boundaries, as on September explained them, is something that's actually in line with the way we think as well in the field. We talk about how um, boundary setting is really something that you do for yourself. You cannot impose boundaries onto other people. But you can set these sort of boundaries for yourself. And this, on a practical way, may look like being able to say, um, you know, to say when you're not comfortable with something. And some people say, I cannot say that to my mother. I cannot say that to, uh, to whoever, fill in the blank. However, what you do is also, what you say is as important as what you do. And some of that relates to having, um, uh, uh, for example, I'll give the example of, of uh, limiting, this is an action, limiting the amount of time, let's say, that you are in a social gathering. You feel obligated, you are expected, you need to be there, and so you go to the social gathering. But a boundary here, in a very practical sense, may be something like you deciding how long, right, you are the agent here of how long you are in that space, or perhaps what you do in that space. And if what I'm saying sounds really difficult or even perhaps foreign, this is where I encourage you again, and I put up the slide for the resources, I encourage you again to make sure that if you feel like you cannot do this alone, get the help in order to do so. Because sometimes you have to break things down into building blocks to take step one, two, three, and four in order to get to a point where you're able to comfortably go into a social setting, right? Let's say something like you're visiting in laws right? Or maybe they're visiting you, right? And figure out what is going to be comfortable enough, what you're going to be able to, um, you know, uh, tolerate and what is not going to be okay. And who and when something, who and when you speak up about something that happens. So for some, they don't really have this issue, or maybe in-laws is not their issue. On a spiritual level, we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us in so many different ways. And for some people, that is the bane of their existence, subhanAllah. And for other people, it's actually not. Their in-laws are just fine. It's maybe their child. And yet for others, it's not the child. It's actually their spouse, right? And everybody has, and Allah tells us this in the Quran, he's going to test us because this is the world or abode of tribulation and testing. And we know the test will come and in different combinations for each other, it's every single one of us. But he also doesn't test us more than we can bear. Right? And so if he can, if he does not, and he promises not to test us more than we can bear, then clearly there's something within ourselves 
and the resources that he gave each one of us to allow us to cope and deal with whatever comes our way. And that means leveraging your tools to the best of your ability. Now, people have asked questions about these kind of relationships that have been um, very harmful. And as I did touch upon, you know, the idea of like a toxic relationship or, you know, uh, people who are very um, uh, uh, controlling, right, was another one that came up today. And here we also talk about in therapy, for example, we would talk about how, um, where is that level of control coming from? Why is that person acting in the way that they're acting? And there may be things that you can do about your own behavior, right? That may actually, like I said earlier, inspire them to change. And maybe they will never change. Part of the acceptance it here is important to you. When people realize that they are, um, that the life they have been given, especially the people in the life, in the life that they have been given, um, a biological relationship will always be there. But how closely connected to that person you are is something you control. And many people don't realize that, either because culture, which is actually the biggest culprit, comes in the way, or sometimes it's religion. And what I mean by that is not because it's a fault of religion, but rather usually it's a misinterpretation of the religion. So what I find a lot actually in therapy spaces is people saying, but Allah said, I have to obey my parents whatever they say. If they're not telling me to do haram, I must. And so there's a really difficult thing of trying to navigate when you can say or don't say that you are willing to, you know, work with your parents on or whatever, you know, kind of bend to whatever it is that they're asking you to, especially questions that came in also about after yourself, you've become yourself a parent and you're not only a grown adult, but you're also yourself a parent and yet your parents are still either controlling or they are um, very kind of coming into your space and critiquing all the time your parenting and other, other aspects. So people have a really hard time navigating this. And you have to know, please, you have to know that one of the main things that we teach in Bir and Wadi Day, which is the filial piety to parents or the honoring of one's parents. Like Ansa said, your parents will always be your parents. But how you allow somebody that has been um, time and time and time again has, uh, and this is where we make that clear distinction. We kind of draw this line in the sand between abuse and between quirks. We, I do this in therapy all the time. I listen very carefully to, is this abuse? As in to say, has somebody taken over um, inappropriately and, in, and uh, egregiously someone's bodily, right, physically, or mentally, emotionally, financially, or, um, uh, you know, uh, psychologically, or any other form of abuse? Have they transgressed those bounds that Allah has put there? And if they have, that's a completely different discussion because there we cut ties. People have a really hard time when I say that sometimes, but that actually is directly from the Quran and directly from our understanding from the Prophet Islam will never allow you to be in a situation where you are demeaned and humiliated or put yourself in a place of abuse and harm. Is a different line drawn in the sand from those who have quirks. And by quirks, I mean they're very um, nosy. <laughs> they ask a lot of questions. They, you know, speak, there's no filter. They just speak whatever's on their mind, right? Right. Some people would say that is abuse. That is not the definition of abuse that we use, for example, in a, but I can see where you're coming from, where that may be something that may feel very much like you're being transgressed upon, right? And this is where the first conversation we had about boundaries and boundary setting would become very important. And if you're feeling like, I don't even know how to start this, I can't give you a formula today that is going to work for each and every one of you here, the many, many mashallah of here that are here. Rather, this is where you need a custom tailored formula for you specifically that's about your family dynamics specifically. And that's why in the concept of therapy, when people say, was this something that's part of our Muslim past anyway? Well, not only is are the Mattis Duns, as our name of our organization, like our namesake, part of that incredible Islamic history and heritage that we have, where the Muslims are the first to put mental health and psychiatric help into their healing spaces. Literally, that's what the Mattis Dun is, or Mattis Dun is the shortened word, for the Islamic hospitals of the past and healing centers of the past, which we're inshallah hoping to revive with your du'as and support. 
And not only that, but they actually created the kind of talk therapies and the kind of healing therapies that allowed people to navigate these difficult things because these are what we're dealing with, the dynamics we're talking about here have existed for centuries and centuries and centuries of old, right? So this is not something new is what I'm trying to say. The other thing that I wanted to say from an Islamic kind of lens when people say, is this really therapy, this really kind of Islamic thing? Yes, of course. In fact, Imam al-Ghazali talks about in his book where he says specifically that when a person is having a difficult time in whatever it is that they're dealing with, we have the ayah of Quran that talks about seek help. Ask the people of knowledge when you don't know. That tells us to seek help. But there's also what Imam Ghazali says, when you don't have the expert there, right? the person of knowledge, what you do next is you find a person who you're able to have as a trusted companion who walks on the path with you, who helps you sometimes see the bumps that you can't see in the road and points them out to you. And this description is very much how we would describe what a therapist is from an Islamic viewpoint. Someone who is literally walking on the path with you, kind of helping point out the bumps, who has some knowledge base from their own expertise, right? Isn't fully um, emotionally tied up to your family and your dynamics, can give you a more neutral and wise perspective, we hope, inshallah, but is guided by Islam. This is the kind of work, inshallah, that we the kind of work that I think many here and many of the questions you've posed could really benefit from, along with, of course, the spiritual benefits, I hope, inshallah ta'ala. And so I hope not to take too much more of your time, but I will tell you this much. All the questions that you have put in the Q&A box we have collected, and uh, our goal, inshallah, they actually do um, uh, register, inshallah, they like were able to continue to hold, uh, hold them. So those that have been submitted uh, last, you know, in the last couple of days before the event, we've processed and used for this event. And those that have been put in the box currently, um, I promise to you, inshallah, is that we will read them and that we'll go through them and kind of single out themes from them. And I hope that that will inform our future kind of learning sessions and even healing sessions. And we're very much open to your feedback. Inshallah ta'ana. So before we um, formally end today, what I want to say is a couple of housekeeping things that we'll end with. But one of the first things is go ahead and put any questions or even thoughts or ideas for future, future healing or learning sessions in the box so that we can um, uh, be back in touch with you about that in future sessions. To answer some logistical questions. Uh, yes, there is a recording, and inshallah, the way you will get it is if you have registered here, we will send out um, an email to all those who have registered as part of our larger mailing list at Madistan with the recording so that you can listen to it more, inshallah. Another thing uh, in terms of logistics, uh, people are um, asking about a client, how to become a, uh, seek out a therapist or client, and does Madison actually take on therapy clients? The answer is yes, in the state of California. So for those of you who are in the state of California, you're welcome to um, reach out to us. We have our um, email, you know, info at maristan.org, where you can um, put in uh, your request. And later, inshallah, in the new year, when we have a full launch to our clinic, our therapy clinic, uh, you'll be able to access all of our uh, the therapists there, inshallah ta'ala, um, directly from the website. We'll have forms there. But for now, if you're in need of therapy from at this point in time and you're in the state of California, um, that is a place you can access it. Other thing I wanted to say, I saw a question earlier about therapy being very expensive and difficult to access. And I agree with you. Hands down. I agree with you 100%. And part of the philosophy that we have at Maristan and some of the other organizations that have taken on the mantle of Muslim mental health um, is to really try to find some ways to help our organize, our, our, all of our um, families and individuals that want therapy. Now, one thing that I'm gonna share with you, and this is a deep, kind of a deep seated request having been in the field <laughs> this long, is that I don't see Muslims yet thinking about giving their zakat or their sadaqah to charity, uh, their charity, or their zakat to mental health. It's not something I see very often. 
often in, when it comes around for Ramadan or it comes for zakat time or it comes for even just sadaqan contributions, all the things that are mentioned in the Quran, mashallah, we do, right? The orphans, relief work anywhere across the world. Um, yeah, even mashallah, many are working with prisoners now and working with um, the, 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 uh, those who don't have much, mashallah. I want to tell you something I learned from some of my refugee-based work. There, in the work that I was doing overseas, you find that, of course, the first human needs are food, clothing, shelter. And alhamdulillah, many organizations were doing that. But so many of those individuals, almost everybody, I would say, had mental health considerations. And because of those mental health considerations, much of which was trauma, along with many other things, depression, anxiety, you name it, as much as they were given food, clothing, and shelter, they couldn't really continue to go forward without good mental well-being. Yet there weren't any, but there wasn't anybody really working on that. There wasn't any charitable causes helping that specific cause. Alhamdulillah, I joined the group that was specifically working on that. But then as I came back to the U.S. to do, you know, uh, here, and I would look around our own communities, and I would say, subhanAllah, we have the same needs here. And so my hope, I'll tell you, this is a very deep-seated hope, and I hope not to take too much of your time, but I'll just share a deep dream for myself. The, you know, one of my dreams is that people think about giving their zakat to mental health. Imagine if somebody is zakat eligible and their mental health sessions can completely be covered because you've given like your zakat to that if you are someone who is able and has to give zakat. And if not, then maybe it's sadaqah, maybe it's your charity. And so anyhow, in Madistan, we have this model that we're using in which there are zakat uh, clients who will, uh, you know, inshallah, much of the session will be covered through the zakat funds, a sliding scale, inshallah. And then those who have insurance, because many who are working may have insurance to use that as well. It's a very flexible model and it does hope to have many people be able to access it, but it needs your support. Now, the long-term goal, because you could say, well, what if I'm not in California? My long-term goal, inshallah, our long-term goal, I'd like to revive the medicines. This healing center that was holistic, that had mind, body, soul, that had all of the different aspects of mental health and physical wellness connected. Talk therapy. Yes, they did talk therapy there. Aromatherapy. They used color and sound. They used all the different forms of your senses for healing. We need to revive this, and it needs to be a walk for an endowment. This is my goal and plan, inshallah ta'ala. And in working and pulling out from the historical resources, connecting it and bridging it to modern clinical resources, and trying to, inshallah, create what would be like a blueprint for this kind of healing. I hope you'll be part of the journey. I hope now you know a little bit more about Madistan, what it's for and where it's going. And in the meantime, inshallah, we'll have these educational sessions. We'll have these healing spaces. And of course, um, if you're, uh, you'll find us doing trainings all throughout the country. And so Tamara would very kindly mention our imams training that was, and it's actually for not just imams, but for religious and community leaders. It's on a very difficult topic. So I'll give my trigger warning here. It's on the topic of suicide, which is a heavy topic and a difficult one. And our Muslim community notoriously does not talk about it. And um, unfortunately, we keep losing people to this. And so it is so important that our leaders are trained in how to do this properly. And Alhamdulillah, Maristan works very closely with my lab at Stanford, the Stanford Muslim and Islamic Psychology Lab. Well, we've developed this amazing training that's a full day certification training that I hope will come to your hometown and be able to train religious leaders, community leaders, Sunday school teachers, youth leaders, youth directors. Um, but these are the kind of things that Madison hopes to do, kind of really spread that healing from a very Islamic lens, but fully in line with the current understandings of mental health from a scientific perspective today, marrying these two together, inshallah, is the work that we do here. So, um, yes, I hope, inshallah, that we will be uh, in your neighborhood soon, but in many ways as well, that you um, join us and continue to join this effort and make du'a for us. At the very least, please keep us in your du'as and keep in touch so that you know what we're up to, what we're doing, and you can be part of the journey. I find this a collective journey where it takes an entire village, literally, <laughs> to, not just a village to raise a child, it takes a village to raise up Madistan again, inshallah. So please, inshallah, um, stay in touch. And yes, I'm seeing some comments here, mashallah, yes, inshallah, my goal is to have all different kinds of, of, of healing. Some people <laughs> ask about naturopath and osteopath and chiropractor and all the rest of it, inshallah, inshallah, in time, 
in time. The idea is that wherever it is that Islam went, one of the beautiful things it did is it encompassed the local cultures in which it went and was ever evolving with it, ever evolving with it. And it took the good that whatever these cultures and civilizations that it entered, never losing its own holistic perspective of healing, as mentioned in the Quran, right? It didn't lose its essence as it took on the best of all the various cultures and civilizations it entered. Hence, as you see, the name Maristan, which is shortened for Bi Maristan, is a Persian word. The Arabic, by the way, is Dada Shifa, same meaning, the place of healing, inshallah. So my dear sisters and brothers, I look forward, inshallah, to continuing this journey with you. I'm so blessed and honored you're here with us, inshallah. Keep with us in our mailing list and in our uh, programs. And with that, we'll do a closing du'a. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, ya Rabbi, ya kareem. We ask, ya Rabbi al-Alameen, to protect us, to uplift us, to empower us. Ya Rabbi, to make us from those who are beloved to you. Ya Rabbi, grant us healing. Ya Rabbi, today our session was on family dynamics. Ya Rabbi, allow our family dynamics to be for us a source of happiness and a source of healing, ya Rabbi al-Alameen. Allow our families, our children, our parents, our grandparents, our cousins, our aunts, our uncles, our grandchildren, Ya Rabbi, our extended families, our in-laws, Ya Kareem, we ask you that all of these different members of people who are in our lives, Ya Rabbi, allow them to be a source of help for us, a source of happiness for us, a source of healing for us, and not a source of pain or difficulty. Ya Rabbi, if we have been hurt, we ask you, Ya Kareem, to open the path and door of healing. Ya Rabbi, allow us to have our intentions today to take the very first steps towards you. Ya Rabbi Alameen, we ask you, Ya Kareem, that you, Kareem, ya, 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 you and your generosity, Ya Kareem, that you and your generosity, Ya Rabbi, shower that mercy down upon us and our families and allow us to be from those who will live happily and dwell happily in this, on this earth and have everlasting happiness in the akhirah and the hereafter. والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين وعلى نية القبول والهداية والنصر والسلام في كل مكان أسألك يا ربي بالسر سورة الفاتحة For acceptance of this dua, please take a moment to read to yourself سورة الفاتحة آمين 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 بارك الله فيكم and inshallah ta'ala, we'll see you next month and in a very short time. And for those, oh, yes, I said I would put the link for the, um, sorry, forgive me. I will put the link, inshallah, here for the uh, Rahma Foundation halakha, since it's so relevant to our conversation today that many of you may wish to join in on raising a spiritual child. And here is the link for you, inshallah ta'ala. Take good care and we'll see you soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.